had kind of a robust uh, workshop earlier. Um, staff did a great job of presenting some information on the reval, and it was a good conversation, so thanks for your patience. So I will call the October 2nd Scarborough Town Council meeting to order. The first item of business is the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Next item on the agenda is item number three, roll call. Councilor Cloutier? Here. Councilor Johnson? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor Donovan? Here. Chairman Hayes? Here. Um, next item on the agenda is item four, which is general public comments. And we appreciate all those that did sit through the workshop. And as we had said at this point, anybody that wants to make any general public comments on items that are not on the agenda, including the workshop that we just had, please join us at the podium if you'd like to come up and say anything. Hello, I'm Betsy Gleisstein. I am from 14 Long Meadow Road. Um, I came to hear the revaluation workshop tonight. Um, there was good information in that. Um, there was another map uh, published today by a person who also does data. We had some data from Councillor Cloutier. Um, and this map actually has a lot of, lot of good information in it and shows um, increases uh, in the uh, taxes, um, as well as sold prices, revaluation data, and all kinds of um, good information. I would highly recommend people um, take a look at this because um, I personally think there's still quite a bit of problems with the data despite all the great efforts. Um, and um, for example, I think John, you said the highest increases were out at Higgins and, and, and Prout's next, but um, this study shows that the median increase in all those areas was about 1.8%. So um, the overall town increase was over 11%. So a lot of people got a very large tax increase in, in a single year. And so I think that represents somewhat of a of a failing by the town when um, people can't plan uh, their tax bill. Um, and I'm still seeing personally, you know, uh, you know, anecdotally, you know, a property that sold in 2018 for 620 that just got valued um, for 535. So there's a lot of anomalies like that. I only have a few minutes here, so I can't go through all of them. Um, it was also said that um, KRT had not had trouble in other um, towns, so I would encourage you to look at what's going on in Nashua. Um, where they're still trying to dig out from some of the KRT questions. Um, and so uh, I think people, this data was good and all the tools you're gonna put up is very good, but I was um, very disappointed to call the town today after I started doing more comparative because a private citizen actually put this up before the town did. Um, did a lot of work, you did a lot of work as a, as a counselor, but a private citizen. And um, I was told I can't get an, an appointment um, with the assessor now to discuss the relative value of my home, that all those appointments are done. Um, I can look at my property card, they'll look at that, but for the um, relative value, uh, I will um, have to file an abatement. And um, there's folks on my Facebook page, um, full disclosure, I'm running for a town council, and they're saying, hey, look at the, look how our neighborhood came out compared to this neighborhood. Why were we up 25% and they were up 10%? So with all this great data coming out, I think there's gonna be more people asking questions. So um, I would just say from here, I really hope that people can continue to make those appointments with the assessors and we can get this data as good as it possibly can be. Thank you. I had thought the, the appointments are going to be open through December, is that? He's is booked through this month, through October. I'll speak to him again. Uh, he certainly wasn't intending to have this go on forever, but uh, I think he's committed to doing the best he possibly can. Um, so uh, I'll look into that. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, would anybody else like to come up and make public comment? If not, I'm closing public comment. Next item on the agenda is item five minutes from the September 18th, 2019 regular town council meeting. Um, motion to approve. So moved. Second. Any comments, discussion, changes, edits? Um, seeing none, all those in favor? Yes, thank you. Um, item six, adjustments to the agenda. There are none tonight. Items to be signed, item number seven, I have signed them. And then item number eight, um, we do have a guest here tonight uh, to kind of take us through a bond refunding opportunity, and that's about as sophisticated as I can get in the explanation. Um, Tom, I don't know if you sure. want to kind of introduce it and then yep. ask, ask our guest to come and, and take us through the basic 101 bond refunding so we understand. Yes, our uh, municipal advisor, financial advisor, Joe Kataro, who's here tonight, uh, made staff aware about a month ago uh, about some really record low, historic low interest rates and the potential for doing the advanced refunding of some of our existing debt. And uh, we were able to sit with him and, and understand some of those opportunities. Lucky enough, we were able to get onto the, the subsequent finance committee agenda. And so uh, three members of this board um, met with Joe and staff and we had a, a thorough discussion around what those options are and what we'd like to present tonight is kind of a, a recommended approach and um, without further ado I'd invite Joe to the podium and I guess Tom I'll, I'll interject and, and my apologies to, to people in the audience that are at home um, Councilor Hamill is not with us this evening he has he's had a family emergency that, that he's in Vermont so he's not here this evening so I'll already point out, yes, the Finance Committee, Don is chair of the Finance Committee, but the Finance Committee did. We spent about an hour with you, Joe, and you kind of were very patient with us and kind. And Council Johnson and I, and Council Emma, I think our recommendation is as we wove through the documents and the process is what you'll hear tonight. So I think we as a Finance Committee recommended that it make sense moving forward. We just wanted to inform the rest of the Council. And Joe, just as I pass these out, are these any different than what was provided last week? Okay, we just have additional copies. These were on the copies. website except for the chronology, but I thought so having a hard copy would be good. Like uh, Joe Kutara, Moores and Cabot in Boston. I do uh, municipal advisory for cities and towns in Maine. Uh, I've been working with the town of Scarborough for over a decade. Uh, and what we do is create bond financings <clears throat> and provide access to the market. Uh, we provide advice on debt policy and rating presentations and a variety of other things. And what I've done is taking your notes for you. Uh, I noticed they were on the website, um, and, uh, but I'll, I'll go through them. And I finally have learned to put page numbers on things rather than sort of show you a page online. But page one is sort of an executive summary that um, the tax reform uh, enacted uh, January of 18 um, eliminated the ability to refinance, advance refund uh, municipal bonds on a tax and basis. And the rationale for the IRS was they didn't want to have two sets of bonds outstanding at the same time. They failed to recognize is the refunding bonds at 5% go away and new bonds at 3% replace them. So you're actually having less tax income, but um, I uh, don't understand everything that goes on in Washington. <laughs> um, however, the Treasury market has had incredibly low uh, rates. Uh, when I approached Tom uh, and Ruth, uh, the 30-year Treasury was 1.9%. Um, I was a little distressed uh, in the middle of September when it cheapened to a 240, 50 basis points, uh, but now uh, it's back to a 2.07%, so we're in a range, a sweet range again. I just did a 20-year uh, taxable financing for the City of Auburn today to purchase the ice arena mm -hmm. uh, at a 2.4% for 20 years. So that tax-exempt mm -hmm. money is cheap, taxable money is also cheap. Uh, and so that's given us, for the first time in my career, I've been doing this since 1972, we are actually seeing a situation where we can refund tax-exempt bonds with taxable bonds and still provide significant savings. Um, the um, other aspect, though, is we're faced with a few conflicts, most of being that the taxable market is a different buyer. It's the Teachers Pension Fund of Texas. 
Uh, it's the uh, savings bank portfolio, which normally doesn't have any need for tax and income because of the write-offs they have. Uh, and so um, they typically uh, eschew having a um, yield to call. And, and so we've addressed that in uh, our discussions. Um, and so if you'll see, I provide three scenarios to the uh, town um, to finance all the callable bonds with all refunding bonds as non-callable. Uh, to finance all callable prior bonds as callable on and after 2032. And we found that that would cost about 25 basis points in yield and it would cost about um, $330,000 extra cost per 10 million. We're talking $40 million. We're talking about a million point two that we lose in savings by enjoying the ability to call the bonds 12 years from now. Uh, the final maturity of the bonds is 2042. Um, or to finance only prior bonds up to 2032 that are now non-callable and uh, refunding them uh, leaving other bonds. And the, the proposal that I have for the town, I've put a summary here and then I'll back it up on a few pages, is that uh, we project that if we refunded uh, four series of bonds, 2011, 12, probably 10, 11, 12, and 13, that are still outstanding, that we would save about $3.3 million in interest without extending the maturity uh, and with doing nothing but taking my 5% mortgage and refinancing at 3%. Um, that's about a 5.8% present value savings. On page two, uh, I've outlined, just for the fun of it, the in yellow, the bonds that we would consider refunding. And the reason uh, that the uh, certain of the 2010, 11, 12, and 13 bonds are not yellow highlighted is because those bonds are non-callable and it only makes sense to refund bonds that are callable before they mature. Uh, page three, and this is probably the most important page in the whole outlook, is the change in the market. Uh, again, October, August the 27th, uh, you'll see that the um, uh, yields were out to about a, a, a 190. Uh, and then when I came back from the Finance Committee meeting the other day, uh, much to my chagrin, the yields were about a 240, but markets change and we continue to look. If we can't save money, we don't do the financing. If we can, we would. Uh, and then a more normal yield curve, which is the current market, um, that the long bond, uh, it says here, is about a, a 210, now it's about a 2.07. So as you can see, just a short period of time, a significant um, change in the market can make the day-by-day uh, -day change can make it or break it in terms of being able to enjoy savings and, and finance it or not. And that's one of the things that, uh, that we're really very um, attuned to. On page four and five, showing the effect of a month wait. On September 4th, I presented Tom and, the, uh, and Ruth with a, um, uh, a cash flow savings of $3.3 million, present value savings of about $2.5 million. Uh, as of September 23rd, uh, that $3.3 million came down to two point four. million. So we lost about $900,000 in savings because the market had changed. Interestingly, if I had looked at this on September um, Pardon me, um, two weeks earlier than that, the savings would have been down to about a million dollars. And so right now, we're actually better off and more in the money than we were on September 23rd when I did this analysis. Um, on page six, and the Finance Committee was particularly interested in sort of seeing some of, looking under the hood, so to speak, that you'll see that um, uh, on the bond summary statistics, uh, we would um, refund the uh, prior uh, bonds. Uh, bear with me for a second. <coughs> Let me just look here for a second. The refunded bonds would be 43,630,000. And what we would do is refund them with 41,900, so we'd have fewer bonds, not greater bonds, no extended maturity, 
uh, and the difference being that we would uh, utilize uh, bid premium um, of about $7 million, uh, which is uh, how we've typically structured our bonds because the investor wants a higher interest rate. But if we give a premium, much as you have a 3% mortgage with two points, you're paying a thousand bucks. A 4% mortgage with no points, you're paying a thousand bucks. So the bid premium is sort of like a vice versa of that, that um, when we, uh, we give the investor a 4% yield, but then have them pay the town 104, 107% of that, the town would in fact get a 3% yield. So we're able to satisfy both, uh, I was gonna say monsters, that was Freudian, uh, both parties. Uh, and then the sources of uses of funds on page seven. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, on page eight was the uh, page that I was looking for. It shows uh, in the third tranche of, of data the refunded bonds is 43 million 630, uh, which have an average uh, interest rate currently. Of 4.001 percent, and we refund we would refund them at a 2.71 percent. So that's the difference is 130 basis points lower interest for the same bonds outstanding that have already been authorized. Um, that is um, my recommendation to the town. Um, it um, makes sense to do it if you wish. If you don't, we won't. Uh, I'm doing a similar refinancing for the city of Bangor uh, and uh, also for the Portland Jet Port uh, because of this anomaly in the market. And the last piece is were we to want to go forward, this is about the most aggressive schedule I can show you, that here is October 2, that we could price the bonds at the end of the month and close on November 14th. The important thing is it's the price of October 29th that locks in the rate. The 14th is a mere formality, so if the market happens to become uh, much more weaker and rates happen to just shoot up, we don't care because our obligation um, and to the underwriter and the underwriter's obligation to us is on October 29th. So that's about 27 days from now, which is about as quick as I can do it. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, yeah, uh, it's a lot of information to, to take in. Thank you for, for pulling it together. I, am I correct in understanding that we would reduce our debt load by a million to $2 million, depending on what the final value is? Is that how this would work? Yes, let's out? look at that for a second. And uh, I like good questions. Thank you very much. Um, would you look at uh, page five? So your gross debt would go from 43.6 million to 41.9. But as you can see in the blue column on the right-hand side, those would be the, average, the annual savings. So it's about $125,000, $100,000 a year after the first two or three years. Because we don't really see the effect, as you remember on the yellowed pages, the biggest portion of the bonds were the 2012 and 13. I mean, it's a uh, 20. Uh, 40 million of the 42 million were 2012 and 13, so we don't see the effect of those until the call date. But uh, on the right hand side is what we project would be the annual savings to the town. It could be reduced debt service, right? Henry debts. Yeah. Okay. Did you say annual savings or one time savings? Annual, sir. If you'll look at uh, page five uh, on the blue column, you can see each year. It goes from, in the fifth year, 111,000 to 125,000 to 110,000. So those would be annual savings in debt service. I mean, the total savings is 2.4 million. Over that. that is correct. The cash flow savings is 2.4 million. So you mentioned earlier, or you demonstrated earlier, there's some volatility. Is there a, is there a point between now and the 29th that this, that you could foresee that we wouldn't want to do this or that you would have to come back before us because circumstances have changed so much or? I, from a legal point of view, I don't need to come forward. Sure. Uh, from a practical point of view, if I can't provide you the present value savings that's deemed significant, then we withdraw the financing. Okay. 
and we have no fees or, or expenses. It's only if, when as and if issued. So if I don't see a present value of savings of around, oh, three and a half, four percent at least, yep. and I would like to have present value savings of five to six percent, then we collapse our tent and keep looking at the market. Okay. Yep. Mm. Yep. Anyone else? Any no, that was going to be my question about the volatility. No, seriously. <laughs> I have it written right down here. No, because uh, I know the market, the overnight lending rates and whatever have been somewhat volatile. And I, is it an inverse relationship? With well, the, the short-term rates are interesting because 30-day um, um, LIBOR today was a 2.01. Right. Um, I, I uh, happen to know that because I have a, uh, a variable obligation for Portland that we price each week, and we compare that to LIBOR, yeah. and we're at 2.00. The yield curve currently has about a um, one-year treasury about a 180. Mm -hmm. The five and 10-year treasury is about a 160. Right. And then it goes back up again to the yeah. 190. So practically, we, have, if no, we don't have a flat yield curve. We actually have an inverted yield right. curve, which is a harbinger to recession, yes. which is a harbinger to lower interest rates, perhaps. Yeah. But we still won't have the ability to do advanced refundings on a tax right. and basis. And right. so we're taking advantage of the market now. Uh, and the earlier you refund, the uh, earlier you're paying 2.7 on your debt instead of 4%. But yes, the market is extremely volatile, huh. and which is why we're hustling to get in here. Our expectation is that the administration won't have had settled uh, um, uh, economic uh, um, tariffs with China. Uh, that uh, there might be some disarray uh, in the administration. Really? I try to be fully <laughs> correct. Uh, and so all of these things are causing a false... It, in 1990, when I worked in Portland, the recession was caused because if they didn't build one more piece of commercial property mm -hmm. in the United States, it would take four years to use the existing supply. Right. The recession in 2007 and 8 was because the housing market uh, was grossly over. Everybody got a very, very mortgage, figuring it'll go up, then they go fixed rate, and all of a sudden found out that everybody went belly up and derivatives were worth nothing. Yeah, I was working as a realtor during yeah. that market. And yeah. uh, the current market is somewhat of an anomaly because it's more international trade related mm -hmm. and um, politically sensitive that you know, we have a press conference, the market goes up. We have another press conference, the market goes down. I mean, we uh, work is now basically junk bond status. And it's, it's really kind of tough. I thought it was a great idea about a year ago. Yeah. So yeah, uh, markets are very volatile. I can't see them going much lower than 190. No, right. So, so your answer regarding if we needed to, I think to quote you, to fold our tents and not do anything, as long as that option's open. Oh, it since is. Since we aren't locking it's, in until I, I can't, I can't do the refunding <laughs> November, if I'm going to save you right. significant money. Right. What we also would do, though, we'd not just fold our tent and sell it. We'd fold our tent and put it away on a shelf. Yes. Okay. And as we get closer to the call date, yeah. there's less negative arbitrage on the escrow. Right. Uh, as we get closer. So all kinds of things happen that we keep looking at this little puppy until it makes sense. Mm -hmm. But the benefit we would have then, I mean, I'd love to have this thing done October 9th, 29th. Sure. I'd love to have it settled November 14th and we go on our way. But we have four weeks from today to then where if we put it on the shelf, I could take it off the shelf in a day and a half. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Thank you. staff will stay very uh, yeah. in, in close contact with Joe. And, and you know, if it's anywhere below four, I think we've got some serious discussion. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And Todd, Mike, you bring us up today. You have had some legal opinions about whether this is a non action item. Can you talk a yes. little bit about the, sort of our, our mindset? Yeah. And Thank you. And, yeah. and where we are. Yes, thanks for reminding me. At the time the Finance Committee took the matter up, uh, we were still doing research as to the original bond authorizations. Uh, again, there's a series of four different bond issues and a whole bunch of detail associated with each of them. There were 20 or 30 different bond authorizations wrapped up into this research. So at the time of finance, we, we couldn't answer the question definitively whether uh, council had existing authorization to mm -hmm. do this advanced refunding. We've now done the research, mm -hmm. shared it with Bond Council, and she's verified that uh, we, you have authorization to move forward so long as you don't change the PARM out. Um, 
or increase it. And that's exactly what we're doing. So no formal action of council is required. You already have authorization. So this is an opportunity to share it with the full council, to certainly make public aware of the opportunity, <coughs> and to really see if we can hit the market while the opportunity exists. At, at the same time, we don't want to do a $42 million financing and spring it on you after and say we did this. We kind of like to, nobody likes surprises. And, and so we wanted to <coughs> be reinforced that you were behind this. Yeah, just to add, and for those people that are watching at home, we did spend a, a solid hour, hour and a half over this topic. So this is not somebody who's taking the podium and saying, hey, I'm playing with $40 million of your money. This has been vetted, and, and this is the second time we've seen this, and we unanimously, as, the, as Peter mentioned, recommended that we do this as the Finance Committee. In my preparation for that, took about more than an hour and a half. Yeah, correct. <laughs> it was a lot of changes. Sure. Right. Yeah. Um, but just as an everybody comfortable? Oh, yeah. Just one more question. Sure, John. What are the negative uh, possibilities of doing this? Is, is there any increased risk with who we'd be placing the bonds with? Or, or uh, I don't see any obvious reason not to do it. I'm just wondering. From, no, it's from like, risk management perspective. I don't care if my Visa card says Capital One or Bank of America. Yeah. I can still get uh, my flannel shirt at Cabela's. Um, and, and so that's their hunt. Once you sell the bonds to the investors, uh, you don't really have say, but you don't really have any concern as to who owns your bonds. Um, at the same time, um, the, were you to have a project that had some strange aspects to it that you might change the use of it 10 or 15 years down the road, you may want to retain the call feature, like if you had a skating arena. However, the 2012 and 13 bonds were for the high school project. Well, chances are that's not going to have a change in use. Chances are you're going to use that until 2042, and it's going to be a high school. So that the cost, we calculated being about $1.2 million cost of having a call feature, was a very, very perilous price to pay for the, condition, for the contingency that you might change the use of the high school. If this were a skating rink, I might be a little bit less cavalier, but... I'm not being cavalier at all. I might be less uh, confident. I mean, the only the only risk is if the interest rates were to go lower, right? Then we we would miss that opportunity to be able to capitalize on yeah. that. So, it's, but you have other bonds outstanding that we also yeah. continue to look at, and and more. so uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, in in right five in, in seven years from now, I'm going to be talking about your public safety building for refunding. Yeah. So we continue to have this mix. So it's almost a hedge that you do what makes sense today because tomorrow is going to have new opportunities. Thank you. So, so I think, John, everybody had kind of nodded. Are you okay? So I think with that, yeah. um, we're good. Okay. Nice job. Thank good. you. Thank you. Thanks it's for joining us. It's important for... not to talk beyond the sale. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. Next item on the agenda is order number 19069, 7 p.m. public hearing and schedule a second reading on the proposed amendment to chapter 311, schedule of fees pertaining in lieu fees for affordable housing and development transfers. Um, and Tom, I don't know if you background and whether we have. Jay Chase is here. Uh, he, I think pretty thoroughly introduced it last meeting. Uh, he's yeah. pleased to do it again if you think it would be helpful for you or the public. I suspect for the public it might be okay. helpful. For, we may have some new book viewers. It's hard to know. Jay, can you, can you give us kind of the elevator speech? And sure, I'll, I'll <laughs> just briefly. Uh, so this is a recommendation. Jay Chase, Planning Director. Uh, this is a recommendation that's coming to you from both the Housing Alliance and the Conservation Commission. Um, what they have done is looked at our in lieu fees in our zoning ordinance in some of our higher density uh, and mixed use zones we have uh, provisions that allow for density bonuses through really two different ways of approaching it. One is uh, by uh, providing for affordable housing. Another is for providing for uh, open space and conserved lands. And in those zones, there's really two ways to approach both of those. One can either um, conserve lands or build affordable housing, or they can pay an in lieu fee. And so the conversation really started around um, what those in lieu fees are. So this uh, proposal coming to you is to, to increase the current fee, which is $20,000, uh, 
um, which essentially is what one uh, could pay for a, a bonus unit um, from $20,000 to $50,000. That $50,000 is based on a, um, the cost of raw land using the same methodology that was used back in, um, uh, sorry, I forget my dates, uh, they're 04, or I think it was actually 2007 when the original uh, fee, the $20,000 fee was created. We used the same methodology um, to, that helped develop that fee to come up with the $50,000 number. And as I said, this is coming to you from both the uh, Housing Alliance and the Conservation Commission. So as a quick overview, I'm happy to go into further depth if needed. Anybody have any questions for Jeff? If not, uh, open it up to public comment. Anybody that would like to come to the podium and speak to this, please do so. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Dan Bacon here, MNR Holdings. Um, I actually wasn't, I'm not here for this item. Uh, we're here for another item on your agenda, but uh, when this came up, I was thinking it might be worth uh, thinking about uh, the in lieu fee. And, and, and I, I feel like it's been a pretty successful um, process for generating a lot of revenue for the town for affordable housing. Um, and I think if they're paying the in lieu fee, I certainly can raise questions as to whether $20,000 continues to be the right number. Um, and uh, I guess I'd, I'd ask staff and in, in the council um, about whether there's been any outreach to uh, affordable housing developers or other developers to see if if it jumped to $50,000, whether it still would be used. Um, I think it's a really good indicator that it has been used um, and it's contributing a lot of money for affordable housing projects by affordable housing developers. Um, a concern I would have is, is $50,000, does it continue to be an incentive um, for a density bonus? And I haven't run the numbers to figure out whether that pencils. Um, for, for a developer, um, but I think $50,000 could be a, a big jump um, and could kind of jeopardize the revenue that the town's getting currently um, for those initiatives. Thank you. Any other additional public comments tonight on this issue? If not, close public comment. Um, and I guess, Tony, this is to schedule a yeah, it, second read? It's already scheduled for the 19th. For the a 19th. 16th. Okay. So with that, um, and Tony, just the, the, the second read is for the, I'm sorry, what went the? October 16th. Oh, October 16th, thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is 19073, 7 p.m. public hearing in action on the renewal request for junkyard permits pursuant to Title 30A, MRSA Chapter 183, Goldstone Steel Company, Inc., located at 36 Running Hill Road, again, or E. Perry Iron Meta located on Ribby Road, Speedway Auto located at 343 Payne Road, and SBR New England LPDBA Scarborough Recycling located at 40 Holmes Road, formerly Scarborough Auto Parts. This oh, is yeah. our annual renewal on these. Cars. <coughs> I believe I distributed this evening uh, from the town uh, planning department uh, from Brian Longstaff, the zoning administrator, and they did inspect the uh, locations and um, best of their knowledge, the locations appear to be in compliance with all state and local ordinances, and um, we recommend approval. Thank you. Um, is there anybody here that would like to speak on this? Harold Elliott. Um, I live next door to Goldstein's, and there's a drainage problem. Um, I brought it to his attention a few months ago. It's been going on for years. And uh, <clears throat> what's happening is everything is draining into my yard from his yard. In the springtime, it looks like, you know, my yard is a mud puddle, you know. It's three or four inches deep. It's like that most of the summer. Um, this summer, of course, it was dry, but previous, you know, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, you know, it's been there since 1947. I think it should be updated. You know, there, there should be a drainage plan there. There's a storage unit right beside it, and he has to have a retention pond and a drainage system. I mean, Goldstein's is, you know, I can 
you know, it's right beside my house and, and uh, you know, there's all this toxic stuff draining into the, the, the soil, you know. And uh, I don't know, I'd just like to see somebody study it, look at it, um, see what needs to be done there. There's definitely something should be should be looked at. Um, I guess that's all I have to add. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else would like to comment on this item? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Is there a second. Was there a second, Bill? Okay. Yep. Any, any discussion, comment? Uh, Council Bob? I'd like to ask whether the <coughs> town manager thinks that the town engineer might look at the situation. Jay Chase has been on looked at it <coughs> with the town engineer a few years ago, and they determined it was coming from there. So there was a problem there. Uh, Mr. Chase is here with us tonight. I'm not sure if he <laughs> recalls that. Um, <laughs> I don't remember all the particulars. Jay Chase, planning director, once again. I don't quite recall all the particulars. It has been a number of years, as was stated, and I remember a lot of the discussions centering around the Running Hill self-storage. Uh, be that as it may, we're really here to talk about the, the license before you. Um, I did have an opportunity to speak with Brian Longstaff, our zoning administrator, um, and so my staff has been out to these sites, and at least in terms of what the license has before you tonight, they have looked at that in terms of uh, elements of sort of uh, the, the drainage, stormwater issues. Um, you know, certainly uh, this has, has been said, this is a, a grandfather site that's been there for many years. Um, so I, I don't have much to offer uh, in the regards to uh, what it looks like today. I haven't been out there myself as, a, as we said, it's been quite a few years, so. So there, there's a motion and a second. Is there any other comments and Councilor Justin? So Jay, if I'm hearing you're in, perhaps this is not you. So I, I don't know. It, are you are you are you affirming that could this issue exist and them still be in compliant for what we need to do to approve this? I guess would be my question. So, I, be, yeah, I believe that's correct. Um, okay, so this, the, the junkyard license, um, there are certain parameters and there are certain things that our code officers are looking for when they're going out, and, and I don't believe that stormwater runoff is one of those elements. They're really looking at are the materials being stored appropriately, are, are things um, enclosed appropriately, those sorts of elements. And again, it's not my area right, of expertise, right, right. Um, but certainly I can uh, ask my staff for further clarification on those items if uh, council so desires. But again, I can confirm that uh, my staff did go out there uh, recently, and I believe you have a memo in your packets or um, has been provided to you that they uh, have found that they were consistent with the licensing. If there are issues on the site, that doesn't mean that our staff can't still get involved um, if there are other issues to be looked at. Um, so, uh, Sorry, uh, maybe uh, I might suggest that the town manager have code staff um, visit the site with Mr. Elliott to understand uh, you know, the issue that he's seeing. It sounds like there was nothing that uh, it was an obvious uh, violation of, of right. their permit, at least at this point, but that doesn't mean that we can't. Well, over the years, it's been filled. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of fill put in there. And uh, when they did that, can you, kind can of you go to the can you have some people at home? Can, can you hear you? There's been a lot of fill put in there over the years. And uh, when they did that, they filled in behind the building, and that's where everything used to run. There was a, a small stream there or what have you, and that's where everything used to drain. There's no stream there anymore. It's gone, so that, you know nothing can drain that way, so now it drains in the front into my yacht. And it is bad. It really is. But, uh, yeah, I'd love to have somebody come up <coughs> and look at it with me. That would be great. I'm certain we can have staff go and... Uh. and uh inspect the site with a particular interest at the, at the drainage. Yes, yeah. Thank you. With that, any other comments? Mm -hmm. uh, Council Johnson? Yeah, so I guess my last comment is, is, you know, this is another thing where it's a little difficult because part of this is a rubber stamp and, and we're hearing about an issue and I think this issue is worthwhile exploring. So I'm gonna be in favor of this, but 
with the understanding the town manager is publicly committed to you that somebody's going to come out and check out the situation. So, I, to me that to me that's a as good a solution as we can get for tonight. So, thank you. Yep. Anybody else? I, I have a quick just a yeah. quick question for Jay. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that um, this is grandfathered because I know Goldstein's. This isn't very far from my house. That Goldstein's has been there forever. Um, if it were a newer junkyard, would it have different standards? Or you mentioned something about grandfathered, so I was just yeah. I, so um, you know, this isn't a project in, in my 12 years here, or a property in my 12 years that has come to the town. So it'll be I'll be interested to look into the <laughs> file and see what we have on record in terms of what the site's supposed to be. Um, uh, so this is where things get challenging. Um, I guess is um, so. As I said, it's, it's been there for a number of years, much like the. So I think I used the Running Hill self storage as an example, right. where that was previously a junkyard that actually converted right. its use to a self storage through a board of appeals process, then through a planning board process, and there was a stormwater management plan uh, put into place, and that I'm very familiar with, and and know we have good plans on record to be able to point to what should be and shouldn't be. Um, with older sites, it, it does get more challenging. So and do we have for, like if I want to start a junkyard today, are there different standards? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, stormwater and whatever? Uh, certainly go through a site plan review process and we okay. would have a full review of, of the merits okay. of the proposal. Because I've heard anecdotally over the years that, and not just this property, but others up there about drainage issues, so that's... Yeah. Anyway, so thank you for the manager. Will, in fact, I think I talked to you. <laughs> yeah, I don't think a change of condition uh, that a grandfather right can survive a change of condition. Uh, if the if the drainage system has been significantly altered, uh, I think that whatever grandfather rights may be uh, challenged. Yeah, I, I, I think the use of grandfather might not be appropriate in this case. And I, I was really thing. talking about the use itself, not right. necessarily the stormwater yeah, runoff well, exactly. or what have it's, sure. it's part of the use. Sure. And if you went through site plan review now, you would establish a drainage system that did not impair neighboring properties. Right. So the, the larger point, I think, is the the operation has been there for 70 years. It was not likely uh, originally fully engineered and so mm -hmm. part of our challenge will be to uh, you know what is the condition that needs to be corrected uh, yep. we don't have a plan to look to but that's not to say we can't work with the property owner and find a solution so, so I think coming full circle this is the <laughs> license I think we're in agreement that as far as the license goes we will I think Councilor Johnson said it most eloquently that we will move forward on the license but the the town manager mm -hmm. and staff has made a commitment to go out and look at the situation mm -hmm. and then report back and, and update us. Mm -hmm. and if that's if everybody is okay with that, everybody mm -hmm. all set? All Good. those in favor then? And thank you. Um, yeah. Old business, there's none at this time. New business, nine, order number 19074. First reading is scheduled a public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to chapter 1301, the general assistance ordinance pursuant to title 22. MRSA 43054, yes. um, and Tom, do that. <laughs> For the new councillors, this is an annual rite of passage. Um, we are directed to adopt the state uh, minimums for the general assistance, and you do that on an annual basis. Uh, you might be interested to know we did look to see if we could have uh, kind of a, a, a standing action that would always update, but uh, the state does require us to have the uh, local legislative body take annual action on these. So as much as you may want to change it, uh, we don't have any control over that. <laughs> so, so with that introduction, is there anybody in, in the public that would like to speak to this item? Um, seeing none, I close public comment, public hearing. Um, the motion's in front of us. Um, I, the motion to approve. Yeah, motion. Yeah. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion, comment? Seeing that we can't do much about it. <laughs> <laughs> this is pretty clean. All those in favor? Uh, it's unanimous. 
Um, order number 19075, first reading and refer to the planning board the proposed amendments to the town of Scarborough zoning map of the Crossroads Plan Development District. And I think we do have, uh, I, I think Dan's getting queued up to sure. bring it forth. I don't know, Tom, if you want to do anything to introduce or is that? I, I, you know, Dan's, Dan's gonna, as he gets settled, uh, essentially the uh, MR Holdings, or I'm not sure what corporate name, but uh, they look to acquire an abutting parcel. And I believe what they'll be asking is to include this new parcel within the Crossroads uh, District. <coughs> Thank you, Dan Bacon, uh, m &R Holdings here on behalf of Scarborough Downs. As uh, the town manager introduced, um, this is a proposed zoning map amendment that would uh, extend the boundary of the Crossroads uh, Plan Development District um, to include a 15-acre parcel that's to the east of Scarborough Downs. Um, I think as many, if not all, the councilors are aware, um, there is a zoning district called the Crossroads Plan Development District that applies to uh, the Scarborough Downs site, um, given the sort of the unique size of the site, the location of the site. Um, and it's really premised on kind of good upfront master planning um, and um, collaboration with the planning board. And it's a it's a really a large mixed use zone that is intended um, to to promote planning and coordination within the property. Um, so this parcel um, is being offered for sale to Crossroad Holdings, um, and it's currently part of the Village Residential 4 District, and that's the zone that's to, to the east of the Crossroads District in Scarborough Downs. It applies to much of the land along Sawyer Road. Um, this particular parcel is not easily accessible to Sawyer Road or um, for development, and that's why it, it makes a lot of sense to fold it into the Downs. It's most easily accessible from the Downs versus from Sawyer Road, um, and is kind of otherwise otherwise landlocked. Um, because it's in, its, in the town's growth area, we felt that it was more appropriate to be included in the Crossroads District um, so it can be uh, developed and coordinated with the overall Downs project. There's not imminent plans for development on the site, um, but given that the land is available now, I thought it made sense to, to acquire and work with the council on updating the zoning. Um, that's uh, basically, uh, in uh, the big picture of the reason for the zone change, the plan below you, um, or excuse me, below this zoning map amendment, this one here, is, is illustrating um, the two different ways the site could be developed. So um, the plan, let's see, on the, on the left side uh, shows what would be kind of development area if it was included in the Crossroads District uh, in tan, and then you'll see in green um, a buffer that's required from the Crossroads District to any other zone. Uh, or any other residential zone, I should say, which the village residence before obviously is. Um, so by including it in the Crossroads District, development will be towards the Downs, and there'll be a, uh, a significant buffer and kind of greenway that will be incorporated into the overall project, and will buffer the residential neighbors that are not part of the Downs project. The village residential four doesn't have that require, requirement, so the buffer would actually happen kind of with, if this was parcel as part of the Downs, happen within the downs, um, and then development would happen outside of this buffer um, and wouldn't have that buffer to any residential neighbors. So our feeling is that it's better um, to have the development incorporated towards the downs, access from Payne Road, Haggis Parkway, Route 1, not accessed out to, to Sawyer Road, and the development be kind of inward facing versus outward facing towards uh, the residential neighbors. So that's sort of in the big picture, the different scenarios in terms of how the site could be developed and, and we think the, the merits of including it in the Crossroads District. Um, in advance of your first reading, we've 
had a meeting with the Long Range Planning Committee to introduce this idea, review it with them. Um, and we've also reached out to the neighbors. So we notified neighbors along this parcel. Um, outside of 500 feet, we conducted a neighborhood meeting at the, at the grandstand. Um, There's a few neighbors um, attended and after our conversations, they had no objections to the zone change. They saw the merits and kind of that, that buffer that they're provided under the, the crossroads rezoning that that wouldn't be the case um, under the VR4. Um, so this is where we are um, after kind of that outreach in advance of coming to you for first reading. Thank you. Councilor Johnson. Uh, I have two questions. One, can you remind me what is the buffer required? Is it 50 feet, 75 feet? What is the what is the size of that, the width? It's a, it's a 100 foot buffer okay. to a resident, to a okay. neighboring residential district. Okay, and exactly. if I'm looking at that right, would you say that that's gonna be roughly somewhere in the downtown area or the innovation district? Because it feels like it's, I mean, just I'm just looking at the right. context map. So it's, the area is, is kind of to the, to be determined. it's below the yep. innovation right. district. Right. Um, this is the, <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is the innovation district up here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I know you can't see any features on here. It's right, a big right. orange blob. Yeah. Um, but the, the track is around in this area. The former paddocks are here. So it's, it's kind of, I would say, northeast of what right. you think of as the grandstand and kind of the center right. of the site. So it, it, is it fair to say it could go one way or the other depending on where the hell the development goes or as far as what might be put there or? It's likely to be um, a transition of kind of light commercial to residential. It's more, our plan along the eastern side of the site, other than the innovation district, is to generally be residential yep. up to a buffer, because yep. it, so it matches well with Sawyer Road. Yep, perfect, thanks. Um, yeah, so it just occurred to me that I should probably make a disclosure, um, just in the go with the will of the council, but my real estate team was involved. I'm not personally representing the seller, um, but my team was involved, so if folks felt like there was a conflict in my vote, I'd be happy to recuse myself. Um, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Do you know how close the nearest residential property is to this parcel? Uh, a dwelling, like a home, yeah. versus a raw land. Um, the closest <laughs> residential dwelling is actually on on the, two houses there. the parcel. So this is part of, I think, a 19-acre parcel, and 15 acres would be conveyed to uh, the crossroads, crossroad holdings, and be part of the rezoning. So the closest parcel is, is the current landowner. And then uh, there's a home, this is LC Way, which comes off of Sawyer Road. There's another home that's just south of, mm -hmm. of that home that I would say is the closest, um, and then there's, there's two homes along Sawyer Road. Two of the, those three property owners were at our neighborhood meeting. Okay. Anybody else? Um, thank you, Dan. You're welcome. Oh, oh, Councilor Last question, just to clarify, because um, so the homeowner is selling you that land, is that correct? So that home that is closest is the current landowner. Correct. Okay. So they're yep. making. And they would retain about four acres okay. out of the currently Their 19. backyard or what have you. Okay. Right. It's yep. it's woods. Yep. Yep. No other questions. Um, with that, so I'll open it up to public comment. Is there anybody from the audience that would like to speak to this? Um, seeing none, I'll close public comment. Um, motion to approve. So moved. Second. Um, any discussion? Comments? <coughs> Yeah. But we had a pretty robust discussion at Long Range Planning um, regarding this piece. Um, there were some concerns about, you know, what's the point of it and, and future use, um, particularly that little jog there. there. Some questions came up about, well, is that like something that will be used as a road someday? But after the discussion, uh, Long Range Planning was satisfied with. Johnson. Through the chair, was there, did they say there's a possibility of a road or has that been pretty clearly? I'll let Dan. Yeah. He was there. I was, the, I was there. Asked, yeah. Asked. 
<laughs> the um, current village residential four zoning doesn't allow uh, right. a through road connection from um, the downs or the crossroads district onto Sawyer Road. Um, so there isn't, therefore, there is not a proposal to, to have a road connection. That jog is not a jog because of a desire to have a road connection. It's, it's the area of the parcel that the landowners are willing to sell. Um, the reason it's shown in green on the plan below is that 100 foot buffer essentially kind of wraps on itself given mm -hmm. the, the yep. width of that. Yep. So it's not particularly usable. And that's why we're showing it as, as essentially providing a buffer. And I guess for me through the town manager or maybe Jay, um, I'll support it going the, the first read to the planning board. But I just want to clarify, I think when we were discussing Piper Shores and something came through the council on the first read, the planning board indicated they thought that that was a nod that the council basically was approving it. I, <clears throat> I would support it because I really have valued the couple of workshops we have done with the planning board where they share their thoughts about mm -hmm. the land use and whether it's appropriate. I have found very helpful in sort of getting to a decision. So my, I, I guess that's a clarity, Tom mm -hmm. or Jay, and, and I don't know if, it's the, if other council members would agree, but part of my approval in the first read would be, I would really love to have the input of the planning board and what they think, and if, if it's appropriate to have a, just a quick workshop for them to share as they have worked through their deliberations. And so I don't know if others support that, but from a, from a head nod or not, or Councilor Kettering? Well, I think, I don't know. I feel like that would be a little redundant, but I'm speaking personally because having sat through the long range planning, yeah, yeah. where a lot of, I mean, the, and there is a planning board member on long range yeah. planning, yeah. but I don't know if that may be redundant. Mm -hmm. well, the matter will go to the planning board, and so okay. you'll, you'll have the benefit of their comment. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilor No, Peter, I completely agree. I, I, I know what you're saying. In other instances, because it's unanimous on the first read, it's like, the, the impression is, oh, well, the council wants this to happen. Well, no, the council's just passing it to the experts to see what they have to say. So I completely understand what you said, and, and I agree with you. And if a workshop's necessary down the road, then absolutely. If not, that's cool, too. So. Yeah, and I guess is this typically the process for us to start a zoning amendment yes. with the council and not with the planning board? Okay. So yeah, I would value what whatever feedback the planning board has as well. That makes a lot of sense. Certainly happy to make all council members aware when this is on the planning board's agenda. Uh, and certainly, if council wishes a workshop, we can try to coordinate that as well. But as our sort of process is laid out in the zoning ordinance, it does start with the council at first reading, goes to planning board for a public hearing, which time we notify folks. Um, and then it does come back to the council for the rest of your process, which I believe is a public hearing second, <clears throat> excuse me, second reading. Um, so as I said, certainly happy to make councilors aware of when this is on the planning board's agenda. Um, and you know, you're certainly welcome to attend or watch that as well. So. And we always do, I, I think just for your benefit and benefit of others as well, the minutes are typed up from the, those meetings and provided to council so you can at least get some, somewhat of the flavor of the discussion. Just a, a final point, uh, perhaps for our newer counselors. Uh, we do use the Long Range Planning Committee uh, mm -hmm. you know, before them, and they were. Uh, so th these these things are discussed, vetted, often changed before it ever comes forward formally and publicly before you. So have some comfort that that's a that's a tried and true method, and I think we get it. They get it right more often than they don't. It seems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess my only comment to that is it, it, it looks like it's getting brought, according to the agenda, it's getting brought from the property owner. So I, I had no indication that it came from the Long Range Planning Committee. I missed that episode. As a matter of practice, <laughs> we don't have that in ordinance, but as a matter of practice, yeah. all zoning related matters sure. uh, need right. to take a stop and, yeah. and be with Long Range before you ever see yep. it. Yeah, the landlocked aspect of this uh, uh, makes sense for considering it as part of the crossroads district. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's otherwise going to be just sort of left mm -hmm. uh, undevelopable. Uh, I'm also not afraid of, of what might be in the future because connectivity is, is critical to good road planning. So that wouldn't scare me one bit that uh, something might happen years from now that 
would uh, would cause it to. Uh, the more we can get to Route 114, the better off we are. Anybody else? So with that, all those in favor? Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to item number nine, standing in special committee reports and liaison reports. And I guess I'll start, John, with you if you want to. Sure. Um, so uh, Paul and I will probably tag team on, on this. So he'll cover any gaps that, that I might <clears throat> leave. Um, but we did kick off, uh, we've had two meetings now with the Ad Hoc Community Center Advisory Committee. Um, it, they've both been productive. Uh, the group is going to meet weekly. Uh, we've got some information on the town website about the committee with uh, uh, some background material and who the members are. Uh, it's a really solid group. We elected a chair uh, this past meeting. It's going to be Matthew Tonello and a vice chair, uh, Stacy Newman. Um, they've both got a lot of relevant experience to the task at hand, so uh, I'm pretty excited to be part of the group. We uh, formed a subcommittee to focus on a survey uh, and how we're going to engage the public in this process, um, and we expect to report back next week. We also identified members to a finance committee um, that are going to be working on some of the analysis of, of costs and operations and to build. So um, there's been good progress there. And uh, Paul, if you want to fill in anything. Yeah, uh, just a quick point of clarification. They're actually co-chairs. Nope. Um, Ms. Newman demanded to be a co-chair instead of a vice chair. But okay. <laughs> no, I'm teasing her. <laughs> uh, yeah, and to actually to add to John, I mean, I, as someone who's spoken uh, publicly about concerns with the timeline, uh, we are meeting every Monday. So if we talk, talk about the sheer number of meetings this committee will have, mm -hmm. it will be a significant amount of meetings. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of work. I think success in this will is has at least the groundwork with having subcommittees with people on it that are interested in those specific areas is a good starting point. So we can divide and conquer a little bit. Um, are you done with your? I am. Okay. Uh, for me, the uh, the BOE, the couple of things happening with the BOE, they have actually had 51 applicants for the uh, new intermediate uh, elementary school building steering committee. So they had 51 applicants for that, which is, uh, they beat us for the number of applicants. They are choosing tomorrow night um, for their, um, they're choosing their committee tomorrow night. And I believe there's gonna be six people, but I might have that wrong. So I apologize in advance. Um, to tie into that, we had a joint finance, I'll give this because Don's not here. We had a joint uh, finance committee meeting uh, this past week and Mr. Cloutier, uh joined us, one of the things that we talked about was the possibility of um, sticking with our 3% mill rate increase goal, but trying to clearly define what that means in the school budget, as we sometimes have an issue um, understanding the school budget does not directly translate to our 3% tax rate. Um, so we discussed having a sub goal. Uh, anything else in that joint finance committee meeting that we came up with? <laughs> Uh, that's my recollection is that they, uh, the, the finance committees are probably going to come up with a recommendation that the new council can weigh in on, but that was the gist of it, was that uh, maybe have a sub-goal for the school committee that might even is initiate with um, the school department. Yep. And one last thing is the regular finance committee meeting, separate of the bond issue, uh, staff had presented to us something that's been in the works, I think according to Peter, for several years, and it's essentially a... Uh, a dashboard of sorts to help the public digest the financial snapshot of the town. Uh, so we gave constructive feedback, maybe some unconstructive feedback, <laughs> <laughs> but we gave some constructive feedback to uh, Larissa of her work. Um, and I, I believe one of the biggest sticking points was we allowed her to go from one page to more than one page if she needed to explain. She was happy though. Yeah, right, she, she was. was happy. In fact, it's the happiest I've seen her for two months. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's all I have. Uh, yeah, so uh, I missed a couple meetings last week due to illness, unfortunately, uh, and including uh, the community roundtable. Um, but I understand they did have five citizens show up. We'd love to see that number multiplied by five um, to have a really robust conversation. But um, that's it for me. My committees will be meeting tomorrow and next week. Councilor Katerina? I don't have anything new, or yes, I do. Actually, ordinance, I do remember. Yes. I don't know what day it is lately, but that's okay. Um, yeah, um, the ordinance meeting was interesting. Uh, we discussed 
we started putting up the framework for how we want uh, marijuana, cannabis, I should say, uh, in town. And Mr. Hamill and I are both, you know, we, we are not in favor of any retail, whether it's medical or recreational. Um, and some of the people weren't real happy with us, but I mean, that's the way it is. And I said, well, send me something to convince me otherwise, and I haven't seen anything yet. Um, but um, what we'll do in our meeting in October, I want to get it off the ordinance table and get it up to council, uh, filling in, you know, what the uh, fees will be, um, what will or won't be allowed. And I mean, ordinance isn't the last stop; it's the first stop. We give the framework, we you know do the vetting, we listen to the folks, both pro and con. If there've been a number who've been con. Um, and uh, we will go from there, so just stay tuned. And I know um, there was an email that came from a couple of uh, attorneys who work on the cannabis side who would be interested in talking to any of you, and I'm just, I think I sent an email out to the effect that I, you know, obviously meet with them, listen to their side, but I just wanted you to know where we were coming from as a, as a committee at this point, so. Uh, I don't have any committee reports, but uh, if Paul plans on attending the school committee meeting to select the uh, uh, steering committee, uh, it would be my suggestion that inclusion of a town council representative on that would be a smart move. And, uh, yeah, that's a good idea. I, they're doing an executive session. I think they're following our lead from this one, but I'll, I'll, I'll shoot an email about one of us sitting I, in. Yeah. I do think that my view on that is shared by others yeah. on the town council. That makes perfect sense. Uh, so. uh, I also support no retail sale. Uh, marijuana was very closely uh, uh, voted uh, in Scarborough, and I think being, being uh, a follower in this particular situation is the smart play uh, to allow uh, other communities to learn from the problems or benefits of retail sales. Uh, it isn't as if we're dying for retail uh, sales uh, here of products. So I, I endorse the, or, the direction the ordinance committee is going. Thank you. Yes, a couple quick things. Public safety building. Uh, we've made actually tremendous progress. Uh, we had a terrific month of September. Uh, we've been able to actually advance a lot of the groundwork. Um, I'm told that they'll actually be putting paint on the interior uh, by the end of the month, by mm -hmm. Halloween, which is just a remarkable feat. Uh, we have been working through a design challenge with the wall system, I'll call it. Uh, this is a collaborative process between the architect, the, the builder, and in the town, that's caused uh, the exterior of the building to be on hold until those things are sort sorted out. So you may have noticed there's not been much work, of, really any work, on the exterior of the main building. Uh, the mason has been on site doing all the interior work, so we've made good use of that time. Um, but they've remobilized, and they're outside as of today, and will remain working on that diligently. Um, and at this point, we're expecting winter conditions will be experienced. It's unfortunate we lost just a terrific weather month of, of September, uh, but at this point our position is very strong that uh, the issues that have caused this delay are not of our doing, and so uh, it, we should not be held responsible for any cost or complications of schedule. And pleased to report the team uh, continues to perform as a team, and so in spite of these little setbacks, um, uh, everyone is stepping up uh, as I would hope and expect. Um, also an update on the sale of the building. Uh, we've got a, 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 an interesting flurry of activity. I'm somewhat hopeful, but I've said that to you before. Uh, I must admit I'm getting a bit anxious because we have we are expecting uh, use of sale proceeds to pay our summer final bills. So um, I'll be consistently, I think, reporting to you on the status of that. One thing I would like to advance is that with any um, Interested part, really uh, interested party on the building. The zoning is always a question, and right now the the lot is actually uh, the zone line bisects the lot, and so we've known that anyone coming in will want and need to modify that lot line or zone line to marry uh, and match with the lot line. 
Um, I've talked to Jay and, and uh, to our uh, a broker. I think we'd, I'd like to bring that forward to the council and have that done so we can maybe just remove some obstacles that every interested party seems to have. So uh, I'd like to move that through long range planning, start there, and perhaps bring that uh, before you as soon as your next meeting. Uh, regarding FEMA flood maps, I reported last meeting that FEMA has reissued revised flood maps. We were given uh, 30 days to provide a response. Uh, there were a number of options that we've been considering in the in the last few weeks. Uh, all you know, there's eight communities actually in uh, York and Cumberland County that are similarly affected by this, and so we've been meeting as a as a group. Uh, met actually three times to come up with you know the most effective strategy. Um, I can't say that all eight are doing the same thing. We've chosen to uh, provide written comments and technical uh, comments to them, requested that they take them into consideration and they engage in a community collaboration using their language. <clears throat> I'm not terribly hopeful that they'll agree, given the stance that they've taken so far. Uh, so ultimately our goal is to pursue what's called a uh, letter of map amendment. So essentially uh, it's another way to get to that same point. Um, you essentially assume that the revised maps are in place and you request a, a change to that map. And FEMA actually had recommended that that would perhaps be the, the, the best approach. So that's the one we're taking. Uh, lastly, two things quickly. Uh, I did attend oral arguments before the law court last week. Uh, this is on the ongoing tax matters. Um, there was some reference in passing tonight in the workshop. There were some changes to some of the waterfront values in 2015. No, 12. Excuse me. Now, where are we at? It's been five years, so I guess it was closer to 15. Um, and, and those tax appeals continue to linger. This was our second stop back at the law court. That's the main Supreme Court. The issue at hand uh, at this point is limited to what is the remedy that uh, the the appellants are entitled to, and I was uh, interested to hear the justices' questions and try to get a sense of where they're likely to come down on the issue, and I was uh, somewhat encouraged with the sort of questions to our legal team and, and to opposing counsel as well. Uh, we're likely to have to wait four to eight months for that decision to come out, mm -hmm. unfortunately, uh, and, but at this point, I, we really don't see the matter would be being remanded back to a local board. They've taken it up twice. I don't know what they would do further. I think the court needs to direct us what that remedy is, and um, I can't imagine we would look to pursue that further if we come out the losing end of that, but I'll keep you advised. And lastly, I just want to <coughs> give a shout out to my staff in the finance office. They, again, have been issued a uh, certificate of achievement for excellence in financial reporting, and that's for the comprehensive um, annual finance report. It's uh, mm -hmm. It's quite a feat, and this is, I don't know how many years running, but it's seven or eight that I'm aware of. And uh, it's nice to have staff recognized for their quality work. Thank you. Thanks. With that, it's council member comments. I think Councilor Donovan will start at your end of the. Thank you. Uh, uh, your brief comment on the uh, Piper Shores exemption appeal. Uh, it, uh, motion for summary judgment continues to track along. <clears throat> uh, I continue to remain encouraged and monitor and collaborate with the uh, uh, outside counsel on uh, what is being filed on our behalf, uh, and it appears to be very good work. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, speak to was the really the three projects, because I think a lot of my anxiety over this is shared by others here. We've got <clears throat> uh, a school study committee, a uh, community center study committee, and a library expansion study committee. Mm. And, and the, at the center of it all, I think, is the town council. And, and the issues that are obvious to all of us are that we need to avoid duplication in the work that's done by these each individual well-intended committees. Uh, we need to establish priorities and I would suggest that we seven should be talking about that more mm -hmm. amongst ourselves. Uh, and we need to be modeling the financial impact, which I was very encouraged to see was a topic of some discussion, at least at the finance committee level, when we were looking at bonds. 
And I think that uh, the, we have the natural setting of the school board finance committee and the town council finance committee frequently meeting. So there's a kind of an easy opportunity to engage in that aspect or that discussion. But those are the three things that keep me up, thinking that uh, we, we, we need to be looking at those very hard so that we have answers. Uh, it's going to be a hard trek to find our way through all of it. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I'm encouraged that we have a council that's ready to make that effort. Thank you. Yeah, um, I wasn't originally going to say anything, but since uh, Councilor Donovan brings it up, I know I, I feel similarly to him. I mean, we do have these three potential projects coming up, and I know there's a lot of angst in the community about that we're going to spend too much money, that we're going to overbond, that we're going to be taxing people too much as a result. And <coughs> I just want uh, people in the community to understand that for one, as a counselor, I would not want to see all these things moving forward all at the same time. Um, we do have to watch what we're bonding and what we're spending. Um, and like Councillor Donovan, I feel very strongly that there's, some, there's quite a bit of overlap when you think about it between the three missions of the three, you know, the library, community center, and schools. Um, so you know, wherever we can avoid duplication and whatnot, um, we need to be doing that. So, and I feel confident that, you know, as a council, we will be talking more about this. So, but I have been hearing rumbles about it when I'm shopping in Hannaford's, which is my forum of choice. <laughs> I don't know if it's my choice, but I do get stopped by people a lot asking about that and talking about that. The other thing I wanted to mention is absentee voting starts Friday. Am I correct, Tony? Yes. So if you're ready to vote, uh, you can do so. On um, you know, you can fill out your form, seal it up, and you're done. Or you can pick it up, take it home, uh, and make your decision. But I really encourage the people of Scarborough to get involved, even though there's not a lot of hot button issues. Uh, it's very important. Uh, as to who's on this town council and who's on the school board. They're important jobs. Um, we spend a lot of time, good counselors spend a lot of time and effort, and we want to make sure that um, the best people um, are in, in the spot, are in these positions. So uh, I encourage folks to become informed and uh, vote. Thank you. Councilor Foley? Uh, yeah, the only two things I had were early voting starting on Friday and uh, candidates night in order to, uh, so you actually can vote before you meet the candidates in some regards, but you might wait till the uh, Tuesday evening. What time does that start? It starts at six. Starts at six, it will be televised, so mm -hmm. tune in, pour yourself a nice hot cup of cocoa and uh, get to know the candidates. And also taped in here. Yes, it will be taped and then replayed, replayed. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Facebook Live, too. Right. Oh, yeah. Facebook and, Live. And, I, Facebook and, I, and Live. I'm not 100% sure, but I, I think if the timeline allows, we'll also have this streaming live on the town's Facebook page for the first time ever. Oh, cool. Um, History in the There's maybe. a couple things that need to fall into place, so I'm not 100% sure that's going to happen, but uh, the, me, the town manager and I and a citizen have been working, well, I haven't been working that hard for it, so that's a lie, um, but <laughs> he's been doing all the work. <laughs> but. The, uh, hopefully the Facebook Live will be a um, normal thing around here that all the, maybe perhaps the important meetings or the regular meetings will be also broadcast live on our Facebook page, uh, which I think lends itself to a huge opportunity to have people stumble upon our meetings instead of having to change all the way up to 1302. Uh, if you're active on social media, you might actually just be caught and say, hey, I'll pay attention to this. So uh, it's an initiative that looks like it's gonna happen Everybody's trying to make it happen before Candidates Night, which would be an awesome launch. We're just not 100% sure. Uh, and just to everybody else's point, you know, one of the good things about uh, we're talking to April Scyther as the liaison to the BOE, and she's the liaison to the town council. One of the things we talked about today, which I thought was incredibly positive, is how um, out of the 51 people that applied for the building of the school committee, and out of the 40-ish that applied for the community center 
how many names that neither one of us recognized. Um, so that's, to me, that's an incredibly good sign that, um, you know, although people might not be banging down the doors, uh, the opportunity to serve is actually bringing out people that, I'm, some of it's because I just don't know everybody, but I think also a lot of it is, is the fact that we have some new people in town or people that are in town that are willing to be more involved. So we do have some decisions to make. Uh, and the good news is hopefully we're going to bring in some fresh eyes and some fresh voices on those committees to help us make those decisions. That's clear. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, kind of uh, piggybacking off of what other councillors have said about uh, competing priorities, and I think we all recognize that. And I don't think any of us is looking to irresponsibly spend a bunch of money unnecessarily. Uh, I think it's um, probably in any of our ideal worlds we wouldn't have these three things at this point, at once, but the, this is where we are. And I think it's gonna be really important uh, for us to communicate across committees. Uh, and I, I actually spoke with Nancy Crawl uh, from the library uh, about that issue, in, in that there's uh, potentially some similar needs between the community center and the library. And yeah. um, I know we didn't think of this when we put the committee together, but I feel like we should invite somebody from the library to um, sure. participate in, in those meetings. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, during the roundtable meeting, I did actually make that suggestion uh, about having somebody from the town council participate with the, the school committee. Now, that it's not our decision to make right now. Uh, so that, that's, I, I think it's going to be really important to coordinate, make sure there's not overlap. And we might identify opportunities to, right. to solve some needs by going through this process. Um, the other thing I've been thinking a lot about is affordable housing. I know that we've, we've had it on the agenda today. Um, and I, I think what's been done at Avesta and, and uh, whatnot is, is fantastic, um, it's beautiful, but it's really a drop in the bucket when you think about uh, the need uh, for affordable housing. And um, I've been looking at who pays the in lieu fees, and it's generally the bigger developments that have a contract zone anyway. So something I talked to Jay Chase, the town planner, briefly about today is just, you know, are we making uh, it possible for developers to build the $1,200 apartment uh, a month apartment instead of the $1,600, $1,700 a month. You know, is there a gap there between what's affordable, which is probably around $1,000 a month, or considered affordable, and where the bulk of our apartments lie? So, um, and I don't have an answer for that. I, I know that there's some, it's a complex topic, mm -hmm. but that's, it's been an interest of mine. Um, and, and then the last thing, uh, a couple of folks talked about it, but um, it's time to vote and, and get engaged. And there's, it's great to see people participating and signing up for committees. Uh, voter participation in June was around 15%, probably just, just shy of that. We can do better. Uh, you know, if you're a resident in town, it's your job to vote and, and to tell us what you think. So, thank you. And I guess I'll just conclude. Last night was SEDCO's annual event where they recognize new businesses and old businesses in Scarborough. And for those that are interested, there are several of us there, but actually the town has put up a video clip of the businesses that were recognized, and I think it's available on the town. I, I'll make it available on the town. Certainly Setco's website has it Setco, available. Yeah. For those that are interested at home, it was really great. They profiled um, several of the businesses and the things they were doing. It was really interesting. So it was a great event. Well attended. It was well attended, yes. Um, so with that, I guess, anybody anxious to adjourn this evening? Perfect. <laughs> move, move to adjourn. Motion so to move. adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you, everyone. So who, who got it tonight? So Paul's up. Paul.